Today, the lemmings are running in a different direction again. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In this week's market review, we start in the US, look at Europe, Asia and end up in Australia. And in recent weeks, I've been talking about the uncertainty principle in that any new data, good or bad, spooks the market into firmly believing the Fed will pivot or alternatively the Fed will keep hiking rates. In the battle for inflation, the problem with being data dependent is that as the data moves around, so everything else shifts. Attention is now moving to November's consumer price data in the US on December the 13th before policymakers meet on the 13th and 14th. But a couple of days back, as I highlighted, the Fed was interpreted as signalling at least a slowing in rate hikes. But the latest non-farm payroll data throws a mighty wrench in the works of that thesis. Powell, in his speech two days ago, pointed out that the Fed cannot increase the supply of labour, nor can they increase the labour force, but can tamp down on the demand for labour to bring supply and demand somewhat in line in order to tamp down on the inflationary pressures that occur when companies are passing on their surging labour costs by increasing prices. This is particularly an issue in the services sector, where raging inflation has now taken hold. And in many services, labour costs are a huge factor. The wage number is a concern and could stoke second round effects on inflation. So, the Labour Department's non-farm payroll data out on Friday increased by 263,000 jobs last month. 200,000 were inspected. And the date of October was revised higher to show payrolls increased 284,000 instead of 261,000 as previously reported. But it was November's 0.6% month-on-month increase in US wages that is going to really shake the Fed. Within Friday's data, what's happening in the services industry is crucial to the Fed's thinking. Analyzing the last three months of data suggests a trend rate of service wage inflation of around 6.2%. The Fed probably estimates that the sustainable non-inflationary rate is somewhere about 3.5% or below. The US unemployment rate remained unchanged, by the way, as expected at 3.7%. This means the US central bank needs to continue tightening monetary policy in the coming months, with borrowing costs likely to head higher than many investors are currently anticipating. As Bloomberg wrote, the Fed has been tightening very rapidly by its own past standards, and monetary policy is now much less accommodative than in the spring, but the policy rate isn't yet restrictive in the ordinary sense. Confidence in the central bank's ability and determination to get inflation back down to 2% is one of its most powerful assets. An official interest rate as high as 6%, up from 4% currently, may be required to curb consumer price increases. With the Fed committed to preventing inflation from becoming entrenched, policymakers are likely to err on the side of doing too much rather than too little. Every time they get a piece of data like the wage gains, it only reinforces their will to stay the course. Ultimately, this is not the job report the market wanted to see, with its combination of an upside surprise on job gains, an upside surprise on wage growth, and a weakening participation rate, LPL Financial's Barry Gilbert said. It's only one report, but the market is clearly recalibrating expectations. So, shares closed lower on Friday in New York, pairing earlier losses, though, after November's job report left the door open for those interest rates to rise higher. Overall, the S&P 500 closed slightly lower on Friday, while the Dow ended just slightly higher, cutting losses on dip-buying momentum in the close after shrugging the red-hot jobs report. The S&P 500 lost 0.12% to end at 4,071, 
while the Nasdaq Composite lost 0.18% to 11,461, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.1% to 34,429. Still, equities ended the session off their lowest levels of the day that had seen each major index tumble around 1%. If anything, I'm actually encouraged by how the market is clawing its way back from the level we were at today. In another, it's another indication the market is looking for at least a seasonal December rally, said Sam Stovell, Chief Investment Strategist at CFRA in New York. The market is beginning to look across the valley and say, OK, a year from now the Fed will likely be on hold and considering cutting rates. But I've got to say, I think the journey could be tricky over that year and earnings are likely to be lower ahead. Even with Friday's weakness, the major averages did notch a second straight week of gains. Growth and technology companies such as Apple and Amazon were down, pressurised by concerns over rising rates. The S&P 500 growth index declined, while technology shares were the worst performing among the 11 major S&P 500 sectors. Ford Motors declined on lower vehicle sales in November, while DoorDash was lower after RBC downgraded the food delivery firm's stock. Chip maker Marvel Technology closed in the red, but well off session lows despite delivering softer guidance and weaker than expected third quarter results. The weaker fiscal fourth quarter guidance ahead comes as the chip maker works its way through overloaded inventory, a process likely to continue into next year. We believe MRVL is under shipping ends demand in the fourth quarter to aggressively lower customer channel inventory, a process that is likely to continue into the first quarter next year, said Deutsche Bank. Treasury yields lost some steam but remained in the ascendancy as investors renewed bets on the Fed's peak level of interest rates or the terminal rate rising about 5% next year. The two year was at 4.2738, while the 10 year was at 3.49. The three year is at 3.9827. In fact, the recession signal inversion remains intact, and the likelihood of rate cuts is also coming into the shorter term bonds now. So, if the market is correct, we could hit something over 5% but then going lower. And that could be, of course, in response to an emerging recession. Deutsche Bank forecasts this week a recession in the US next year and estimates that markets could fall by around 25%. And as Alberta Puro, trader and co-founder of Sailor Power Traders noted, the US Federal Reserve points to the highest odds of recession in the next 12 months at 45%. That's the highest on record. And if the Fed sees a 45% chance of a recession, the probability is clearly much higher. Meanwhile, Mike Wilson, Chief US Equity Strategist and Chief Investment Officer at Morgan Stanley, also predicts that stocks will suffer a double-digit decline by early 2023. Wilson, whose target for next year of the S&P 500 is 3,900, warns that US companies are prepared to unleash downward earnings revisions that will hit stocks. It's the path. I mean, nobody cares about what's going to happen in 12 months. They need to deal with the next three to six months, Wilson said earlier in the week. That's where we think there's significant downside. So while 3,900 sounds like a really boring six months, no, it's going to be a wild ride, warns the expert. And this means the S&P 500 could fall by as much as 24% between now and early 2023. The bear market is not over, Wilson notes. We've got significant lower lows if our earnings forecasts are correct. Yet despite this scenario for next year, Wilson believes that this is not a time to sell everything, as he still expects some bullish moves to boost stocks over the next few months. Now, my own strategy has been to sell into strength selectively, and I'm going to continue that approach because I too believe the downside risk is significant. Gold, meantime, retreated into familiar $1,700 territory after the release of the upbeat monthly US jobs report. But while gold closed the day down, it rose sharply on the week after 15 weeks of being trapped at around 1,700 ranges, 
or lower, COMEX and SPOT gold broke free to hit a five-month high above $1,800 an ounce on Thursday as easing US inflation and jobs growth pointed to the likelihood of smaller Fed rate hikes from this month forward. Gold has had a nice rally since early November and profit-taking could settle in, but a significant pullback doesn't seem warranted, said Ed Moyer at Onya. The economy is slowing down and inflation should steadily decline here and justify a pause in Fed rate hikes after the first quarter. Benchmark was 1,811, an ounce on New York Comics, down 0.21%. For the week, though, it was up 3.1%. The spot price of gold, which is more closely followed than futures by some traders, remained just below the $1,800 mark, trading at 1,799.03. The US dollar index, which measures the greenback against a trade-weighted basket of six major currencies, fell 0.04% to 10465, easing from a session high of 10556. We believe that the recent pullback in the dollar is overdone and unlikely to see much follow-through from here, Wells Fargo said in the note earlier in the week. Further rate hikes will prop up demand for the greenback even at a slower pace as the underlying fundamentals and interest rate differentials continue to favour the US currency, they said. With the dollar nursing a more than 7% loss since early November, others have suggested that it's too early for the long wave goodbye on the dollar's bull run and question marks bets that Powell isn't likely to keep rates higher for longer. Investors move to call Powell's higher for longer bluff is premature and may not be sustainable if the Fed increases the volume of its rate protests by sounding more stubbornly hawkish and the next inflation readings argue against a rapid descent in inflation, ING said, adding that economic troubles in Europe play into the dollar's favour. Incidentally, the global macro picture remains challenging, especially in Europe, where colder weather may push gas prices much higher, and China, which also points to dollar resilience, ING added. Energy stocks were dragged lower by a slip in oil prices ahead of a meeting of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies, known as OPEC+. Plus. Pointing to OPEC Plus's decision to opt for a virtual meeting rather than an in-person meeting, RBC said the group's decision to opt for no drama optics seemingly increases the likelihood of a rollover decision. So oil futures slipped 1.5% in choppy trading on Friday ahead of that meeting, which is on Sunday, and also an EU ban on Russian crude, which comes in on Monday. Brent crude futures settled down 1.27% to 85.94 a barrel, and US West Texas intermediate crude futures fell 1.8% to $80.34. Both contracts dipped in and out of negative territory but notched their first weekly gains of around 2.5 and 5% respectively after three consecutive weekly drops. Traders will be hesitant to be short over the weekend if there are growing rumbles that OPEC might try to shock and awe the market at their weekend meeting, said Phil Flynn, an analyst at Price Futures Group. OPEC Plus is widely expected to stick to its latest target of reducing oil production by 2 million barrels a day when it meets on Sunday, but some analysts believe that crude prices could fall if the group does not make further cuts. Crude carries significantly more weekend risk and could be extremely volatile on the open next week, said Craig Erlem from Onya a view echoed by other analysts. Russian oil output could fall by 500,000 to 1 million barrels per day early in 2023 due to the European Union ban on seaborne imports from Monday, according to a couple of sources. Poland agreed to the EU's deal for a $60 per barrel price cap on Russian seaborne oil, allowing the bloc to move forward with formally approving the deal over the weekend according to Poland's ambassador in the EU. And European Commission President Ursula von Leyen said the Russian oil price cap will be adjustable over time so that the Union can react to market developments. Russian Ural's crude traded at around $70 a barrel on Thursday afternoon. The cap was designed to limit revenues to Russia while not resulting 
in an oil price spike. Sending bullish signals, China is set to announce an easing of its COVID-19 quarantine protocols within days, according to Reuters, which would be a major shift in policy in the world's second biggest oil consumer, although analysts warn a significant economic reopening is unlikely for months. The US oil rig count, an indicator of future production, remained unchanged this week, according to data from Baker Hughes. Worries also accelerated that US shale can no longer boost production at short notice. Now, over in Europe, European stock markets traded largely lower on Friday, with gloomy data illustrating the difficult economic circumstances in Europe as investors cautiously awaited the release of those key US job data figures. The DAX in Germany traded 0.27% higher to 14,529, while the CAC 40 in France traded down 0.17% to 6,742, and the FTSE in the UK dropped 0.57% to 7,556. Economic data released on Friday showed that France reported the sharpest drop in its industrial production in 19 months, falling 2.6% in October from September. That's a second straight monthly drop. And earlier in the day, the Eurozone's largest economy, Germany, said its exports had also started the fourth quarter in weak fashion, falling by 0.6% from September. That's also the second straight monthly decline. Inflation in the Eurozone fell more than expected in November, but remained near record levels at 10% on an annual basis. And the European Central Bank has to negotiate these difficult economic waters as it's tasked with maintaining inflation around 2% in the medium term. But the Eurozone looks set to enter recession in the near term. And of course, the UK is already there. The ECB President Christine Lagarde warned on Friday that some European government's fiscal policies could lead to excess demand, prompting the central bank to have to tighten monetary policy more than would otherwise be necessary. And in the corporate sector, Credit Suisse rose 0.9% after the chairman of the embattled Swiss bank said that outflows from the lender had basically stopped and that it was seeing partial inflows. Analysts at influential investment bank JP Morgan earlier on Friday suggested that continued client outflows could spark takeover speculation and may lead to the partial sale of its domestic unit. Now in Asia, most Asian stock markets retreated in cautious trading on Friday ahead of those key US payroll data figures. But a report that China plans to further scale back its strict anti-COVID measures did help to limit losses. China's Shanghai Composite fell 0.29% to 3,156 and rose 1.7% for the week, amid growing speculation that China will indeed lift its strict zero COVID policies. Reuters reported that the government is mulling such a move in the face of unprecedented countrywide protests against its lockdown measures, as well as sagging economic growth. A reopening could come as a great source of relief for Chinese markets and broader Asian markets that depend heavily on China. Hong Kong's Hang Seng fell 0.33% on Friday to 18,625, but was up more than 2.5% on the week. But Japanese stocks were a major outlier this week, with the Nikkei 225 sinking 1.7% on Friday and losing nearly 2% this week on higher inflation worries. In fact, a slew of weak economic readings this week ramped up concerns over a Japanese economic slowdown as the country grapples with rising inflation and a weak yen. The yen was 134.30 against the dollar. Now in Australia, shares in the ASX energy sector dropped on Friday after lower oil prices slipped ahead of a major petroleum producers meeting over the weekend. The S&P ASX 200 E 0.7% to 7,301. The oil odds dipped by a similar margin to 7,503. The main index rose 1.3% this week, its second consecutive gain. Santel shares died 3.8% to $7.15 after its Barossa gas appeal against a federal court judgment that forced it to cease drilling on a $5.3 billion gas project off Australia's north coast was dismissed. New Hope Company shared 2.4% to $5.74. Whitehaven Coal lost 1.5% to $9.74, and Woodside Energy skidded 2.6% to 
Shares in Beach Energy dropped 2.4% to $1.80 after sweetening its offer for an escalating takeover battle for West Australian gas developer Warango Energy. Gina Reihart's Hancock Prospecting made a surprise bid this week. Warango Energy bucked the trend to jump 8.5% to 28.2 cents, touching its highest level in three years. Warango said that the latest offer, which would be supplemented by proceeds from the sale of its Spanish assets, will consider the beach counter-proposal and advise shareholders to take no action for the time being. Corundo Global Resources, meantime, died 4.3% to $2 after warning its Kurungai site will not meet production volumes and mining cost guidance due to extraordinary rain in the Bowen Basin. Transurban stocks fell 1% to $14.15, even as it reaffirmed distribution guidance of 53 cents for 2023. And primary investment shares dipped 0.5% to 25.40, despite record sales in the Black Friday trading week. All the major banks retreated, with CBA down 1.36%, ANZ down 1.2%, NAB down 0.95%, and Westpac down 0.67%, and Macquarie dropped 1.02%. Mining giants also slumped with BHP down 1.55% and Rio Tinto down 1.14%. Gold companies, however, rallied after the price of the precious metal topped levels last seen in August. St. Barbara surged 10.4% to 69 cents. Silver Lake Resources leapt 7% to $1.37. And Newcrest Mining lifted 1.2% to 2109 Evolution Mining edged up 0.7% to $2.88. And Northern Star Resources advanced 1.5% to $11.08. Of course, next week we get the final RBA decision of the year. Speculation is building that they may not have to lift interest rates as high as expected after the October Consumer Price Index showed inflation surprisingly slowed last month, although not enough to derail an expected cash rate rise next week. So 55 basis points is the main call to 3.1%. But of course, those CPI numbers were number wanged, as I discussed earlier on. The monthly consumer price index rose to an annual pace of 6.9% in October, down from 7.3% in the previous month. The outcome missed forecast for a hotter 7.6% increase. The main drivers were a sharp slowdown in food inflation as prices of fruit and vegetables nearly halved and holiday travel. The trimmed mean, the Reserve Bank's preferred measure of inflation, accelerated by 5.3% on an annual measure, compared with 5.4% in September. But there was some rebaselining within the numbers, which explains more than half of the change. HSBC Chief Economist Paul Bloxham said today's data suggests that inflationary pressure in Australia remains high, but has eased and seems to be past its peak. RBC Capital Markets Chief Economist Su Ling Ong said the Reserve Bank is expecting inflation to peak in the current quarter and today's figures are consistent with their views. The figures won't materially change its inflation profile as it is still elevated and October is only the first month of the quarter. The RBA projects price growth to peak at 8% by the end of the year. Capital Economics Senior Economist Marcel Fiance said we wouldn't read too much into the drop in the monthly CPI indicator in October because the figures don't cover the entire CPI basket. But the data suggests that inflation is about to peak. Given the natural pause in January, when the board doesn't meet, we expect another 25 basis points increase at next week's meeting, said ANZ senior economist Catherine Birch. Interbank futures slightly paired back expectations of a quarter point cash rate increase next week, with an 83% chance of a move from 85% before the data. They imply a 17% chance the rate will hold steady from 20%. And they also trimmed the expected terminal or peak cash rate to 3.7% from 3.8%, though economists are not as hawkish as rate traders. At face value, this strengthens the case for the RBA to consider a potential pause in its rate hike campaign after next week's likely eighth rate hike this year, said BetaShares Chief Economist David Bassians. ANZ and HSBC echoed the view, saying the central bank might consider the possibility of pausing at its policy meeting next week. Wednesday's CPI report follows scorching inflation in the December quarter, when annual price growth raced to 7.3% as the cost of gas and home building soared. Trimmed mean inflation rose 6.1% in the period from a year ago. 
That's the highest since the ABS started back in 2003. These figures will come as some good news for the RBA, but three-year government bond yields, which reflect interest rate expectations, rose, and the 10-year edged up. Some economists, however, think the RBA is underestimating the inflation outlook and will be forced to raise interest rates higher. Goldman Sachs forecasts the cash rate to peak to around 4% by May next year. A massive inflation overshoot will make it hard for the RBA to pause tightening cycles in the first half of 2023, particularly with wages accelerating and upside risks to inflation expectations, said Andrew Bark, chief economist at Goldman Sachs. If they do pause, the risk is that they will just be playing catch-up later in the year. And earlier in the session, the Australian dollar had rebounded on hopes of a looser approach to dealing with the COVID-19 in China, following an unprecedented wave of civil unrest against unpopular and strict measures. On Tuesday, China said it would speed up vaccinations for the elderly, a move viewed as a strong signal in a strategy to unwind nearly three years of strict curbs that have eroded economic growth and rattled financial markets. The Australian dollar is often seen as a liquid proxy of Chinese growth because of the country's strong trade links. And the Aussie dollar briefly dropped 0.2% to 6669 before retracing all of its losses. In fact, it rallied 0.6% on Tuesday. And finally, as the FTX saga unwinds, some more Bitcoin and Ethereum are just a little stronger, with Bitcoin at 17,049, Ether at 1,291 at last look. But the risk of the downside is still there, and some are suggesting a buy price of Bitcoin of around 12,000 US or even 3,400 US. After his bankrupt crypto exchange locked up the funds, of what is likely millions of customers, Sam Bankman Freed had some fresh advice for investors that they probably wish they had heard earlier. Put your money on an exchange that doesn't do business like FTX. While speaking at the New York Times Deal Book Summit on Wednesday, Bankman Freed said crypto investors should look for all the things I wish FTX had been able to supply. He said, proof of reserves and regulatory reporting that includes metrics like customer assets and liabilities are all things investors should look for when picking an exchange. Bankman Freed admitted during the conversation with New York Times columnist Andrew Ross Sorkin that he screwed up when he was CEO of FTX and that he should have paid closer attention to risk management and protecting customers. He said that he didn't ever try to commit fraud, but also didn't provide a straight answer when asked if he'd lied at any point. For XTX customers who've been frozen out of their funds, Bankman Freed offered a bag of mixed messaging. He said he believed that they could be made whole, especially those who used FTX US, but also said, I can't promise anyone anything. The unprecedented and unexpected collapse of FTX, which boasted a $32 billion valuation, but while sliding into bank from November the 11th, sent shockwaves through the crypto industry. And now the digital asset sector is bracing for widening contagion. It owes its 50 biggest unsecured creditors a total of, wait for it, $3.1 billion. So the takeaway message again today is simply uncertainty, significant uncertainty about what's going to happen, how it's going to play out. There is, I think, still an opportunity to look to cash out on peaks in the markets, but I wouldn't be going back in holus bolus at the moment because, like many other people, the risk of the downside seems to me to be significant and extended. A recession is still on the cards and interest rates will still go higher. We're not quite sure how much higher, but they will go higher. And by the way, that has a significant knock-on effect for property and other assets too. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.